Why should you ever be disappointed at anything at all that happens to you? Anything. Why are you disappointed? Because you set up an expectation. Why do you set up an expectation? Because you wanted that forthcoming event to fulfill something in you. If you're already fulfilled, if you really were, then you wouldn't need an ex expectant future event to make you feel fulfilled. And you wouldn't be disappointed. Why are you disappointed at anything? Why aren't you so complete that nothing can disappoint you because nothing can, nothing can deny you? Nothing can cheat you. You're not living from your own nature, are you? You're living from something that demands to be supported, that demands that something outside of itself come and prop it up a little bit. When are you going to knock aside all props? See, I'll tell you what. It's like a man who has crutches or something. He has an overcoat over the crutches. And he goes around and tries to make people think he's walking on his own. And he doesn't want people to see that he has these supports. If he would be the, have courage enough to take off his overcoat and throw away the crutches, he would have to go into this stage of humiliation we talked about, wouldn't he? Saying, you see, what a fake I've been. How many of you have been a fake all your life? Everyone raise your hand. A big phony all your life. I'll tell you, why don't you just take the overcoat off, throw the crutches away, and let yourself and let everyone else see what a mental, spiritual cripple you've been all your life. It's very humiliating to the ego. You know that. But go ahead, throw them away and flop down and, and look up. I'll tell you, how many of you were ever children? <laughs> All right. How many of you are still children? <laughs> Couldn't resist. I tell you, when you are a, were a child, your worst pain, which caused hatred in you, was to have people laugh at you. Right? Do you remember the other kids? You remember how remember how cruel kids were to you and how cruel you were to the other kids? Eight, nine, ten, fourteen. Remember how vicious kids can be horrible. You know that. All right. Now that has held over up until this point in your life, where you're afraid to be laughed at. And now let, let's find out why you're afraid to have people laugh at you, because their laughter is insight into you, seeing through you. Now, if they see through you, you're forced to take a, at least a brief look at yourself, your own phoniness, how mad you are all the time. And that you don't like, because if you sense that that is unreal, then you don't know who you are. I'm telling you, the, the, the way to, to real contentment is right in that, that little example of bearing to be laughed at. Because if someone laughs at you because you thought you were graceful and they proved you were clumsy, you had an image of being intelligent and you flopped the test in the sixth grade or in the army or wherever, you flunked the test, then, then you can't call yourself intelligent, one of the gang. Everyone else passed. Remember in the eighth grade they passed and you flunked? Remember how humiliating it was? But right in that is the key to great, enormous, true self-transformation in which you lose your picture, your darling picture, idealistic picture of yourself as being one of the gang. You know, well, we're all in this class together. We'll advance to the next grade together. You lose, this is in life, you know, you get fired or whatever. And, and in life, if that happens to you, why don't you invite yourself to descend fully into the flames of hell with, without any images at all, without any ideas at all who you are? Passing through hell essentially means the taking off of all ideas, all descriptions, all vanities, taking them and casting them aside, all successes, being 
100% failure in life. And you are a failure. Do you know that you're a failure in life? Now, if you can accept the fact that you are a failure and endure the pain, stick with it, if you stay with that, then you'll be forced to see, in spite of the darkness inside of you, you'll be forced to see that you do not have any identity. Now, you've seen the tragedy and the wrenching of the identity of being a good husband, of being a good wife, of being a good money maker, a good family man. You're, you're a good family man, woman, and you get divorced. That's shattered. And you think you can go out and make a lot of money, and you get a college degree or two, and you can't make any money at all, or just, just enough to get by, and even that is doubtful whether you'll be retained on the employment force or not. I think I'll just continue with this for a while. Why don't you let the world rob you of everything that you now hold precious? Why don't you let the world win? What I'm saying is, why don't you, why don't you go ahead and be defeated? Be humiliated. Being, being nothing at all. Now you're someone. You're someone, aren't you? You're even someone who's liked by the people in this room. You're liked by the people in this room, and you don't even like yourself, which proves that you're divided. All right, we'll go on with what's regular. Are we all right with everything? Okay. Still up there. Right. This is a continuation. Everything connects. Darkness, lostness, evil cannot understand itself. Darkness has no ability to be anything but darkness. Now, when I say darkness, are you following me on that? Neurosis, wrongness, violence. Darkness is one thing in itself and has nothing but itself in itself. Just follow. You'll get it after a while. Therefore, it can't change itself. Darkness can't change into light. Darkness can't be improved. Darkness can't grow lighter and lighter until it becomes light. Its nature is fixed permanently. There's no way a bit of darkness can step outside of itself and look back and say, that is darkness, that is evil. Try to connect while I'm talking what I'm talking about with world events and with your events. Evil, darkness, not being able to hear anything outside of itself, do you now see why it is pointless to moralize with an evil man? Do you see why sermons never do any good? Moral codes, ten commandments or a thousand commandments, never do any good. Because darkness is itself and only itself and therefore the light can't come into it there's no penetration darkness can't therefore understand itself or light it can understand nothing neither of the two skip over light for a minute I know how complex this is, but you'll see. Light can understand itself and can also understand darkness. Remember 
that day in this class or elsewhere where something in you began to understand what was going on in you? That was a miracle, and we'll get to that a little later. A shark is swimming around the ocean. And you know what a vast place the ocean is, two-thirds of the surface of the world. The shark swimming in the ocean exists in the ocean, but he doesn't understand it. And he chases other fish, and he rests, but he doesn't understand the ocean, and listen to the reason why. He doesn't understand it because the ocean is not the all of the world. Next time you see a shark, talk to him about the sky and see if he understands you. If you see a shark, talk to him about land with people and trees on it and see if he understands you. He won't. A shark swimming around the ocean can never be anything but a shark in the dark ocean because his nature is fixed to the ocean. Now let me jump. I hope you're making connections. A human devil can only be a human devil. He can never be turn and be good. His darkness is always darkness. I hope you're connecting this with you and with the world. We're not talking about fisheries or oceanography. The shark swimming around the ocean doesn't know of the existence of anything outside of it. Evil human beings, human beings who hurt each other, have no idea of the existence of anything. They, the only thing they know and live in is their darkness. And back again, there's no point talking to them. There's no point trying to tell them ab about another world because there's no way their shark-like nature can understand it. Now we'll, we'll get some good news into here. It's all good news because this is all factual. Light. Is the rabbit on land ever have to be afraid of the shark? Different, right? A rabbit can run all around. It doesn't, it doesn't have to think about it. He's safe from it. Here's what I'm saying. If you grow, and we'll get to that too in a little bit, if you grow with a third factor, which I'll introduce in a minute, if you grow, then the light that has come into you, which has not reformed the darkness, but has displaced it, then the light that comes into your life, the light itself is healing. The light itself is corrective. The light is everything. There are no problems in the light. What I, look, please. You're going to go out of here and ask how to solve a problem. I told you. You're going to go out of here <clears throat> and be in pain and in conflict and confusion when it's not necessary. Because the light is altogether healing. To be in light is to be healed. What are you doing trying to think yourself out of the ocean, out of your shark-like nature? You can't. The shark will never become a rabbit, never can become a bird. He's fixed where he is. Woe unto any preacher, any teacher, any philosopher, any writer, any parent who tells another human being that you can change your darkness, your evil, into goodness and light. Anyone who tells you that doesn't know, doesn't understand, and he is destroying you. I'm trying to get a very powerful point over to you, which is to tell you 
the only chance you have, and this is the third factor, we have darkness, we have light, here's the third factor, here's, here's where you come into it. It's very strange, and it's not at all popular. How do you, how do you change your nature? That is, how do you displace a nature that's hateful, which yours is, tricky, which yours is, self-pitying, which yours is? How do you change it? Listen, listen to the procedure. Human interest in studying human evil produces the miracle of self-transformation. Human interest in studying human darkness is the beginning of the miracle. Any of you who have been coming here for a while, if you've authentically made change, even a change in direction, that is the first mighty miracle in your life. That you, of all people, finally said to yourself, enough is enough. Enough calling my darkness goodness and going around with phony smiles, which a lot of you do. You don't know how deep your pretense is. There is a study, which is the same thing as saying an entity, a point, which is outside the darkness itself, which looks back and begins to investigate it. Begins to even catalog it and say, this is called hatred, this is called jealousy. Now this part, this willingness, this wish, and this interest to study dark human nature never, never, never can be part of the dark human nature. See, the devil never investigates himself. He only investigates another devil, and he doesn't know that that other devil is himself. So he does investigate himself. He does hate himself. The devil hates himself when he hates another human being. But he has no understanding. So this, so there's this part of you, you're beginning to get onto these things, which stands aside and says, I'm going to investigate why I was mad why I am always get a little bit afraid when I even approach the home of those certain people. Aren't you studying evil? Don't you know that nervousness is evil? What are you going to call it? Good? It's good to be nervous? Good to be agitated? Once you start studying the darkness in yourself, you, you understand, you can go off in a thousand directions, and one thing, you, one thing you understand at the beginning is that you have no power to change it. You can't do a thing for yourself. What you can do, as you should know by now, is yield. But listen to this. Listen to this. You, you ought to take this tape home tonight and and read and hear it over and over for this one point alone. All right, you're studying your own human nature, correct? You're studying your own weakness. And one day, you're walking around the house, rightly pondering these things, and you clap your hand to your forehead, and you you, you, you shout. It was my loneliness that wanted to get married. I thought it was me. Right? My loneliness that wanted to get married. No wonder it was such a miserable relationship. When you got married, weren't you just as lonely as you were before? The next day you're on the right track and you clap your hand to your forehead again 
And you say, it, it, was, it was my agitation that wanted to take that long, stupid trip. I was just agitated. I didn't know what to do with all that energy, that nothing machine just churning and making all this racket. I didn't know what to do with it, so I decided to take a dumb trip. It was my, it was my hostility that wanted revenge against that other person. My hostility, ah, ah. But I read in that book something that now makes great sense to me. I understand it now, which is that I am not my loneliness. I am not my anxiety. I am not my hostility. I really am not. I am not my own darkness. Darkness is darkness. It is not me. And I refuse to ever accept it as being me again. Never. Oh, boy. Your, your spiritual life is going to roll along at a thousand miles an hour when you see that. The light tumbles in and from a thousand directions, giving a thousand of these healings that we talked about. You begin to get practical in your thinking. You begin to get reasonable. You say, look, when I was one day old, I didn't have all, all these experiences that I had now that made me such, such a sour human being. How many of you are sour? You know what it means to be sour, you know? Not even pleasant. I didn't have all these that made me sour, that made me insecure, but I have them now. Therefore, somewhere, everywhere, I added these to my psychic system and became what I am today. Any junk that you have put in your cupboard, you can take out of your cupboard. Well, of course, you're so used to seeing it up there. It's expected, it's familiar, that you want to take the work of throwing the junk out to replace it with something else. But, okay, you're working on yourself, and you're getting a little intelligent spiritually, and you begin to make long, powerful connections between all the knowledge that you've had. When you hear a voice in your head, you no longer know it's you. You know, you know that it is not you. Shall I embarrass you a little bit? This is okay. How do you swear under your breath? Huh? Curse, curse under your breath, bad words, hurl insults at the other driver, things like that. Do you do that? Sure you do. Now look. <coughs> human interest in studying human nature. The next time that happens to you, I want you to know that you didn't say that at all. But you want to be a guilty sinner, don't you? You want to say, oh, boy, I'm sure glad, you men especially, I'm sure glad those women don't know what lustful sex thoughts I have toward them. Oh, I'm glad they don't know it. If they, if they knew what an animal I am, don't you know what you're... Do you understand what you're doing when you say that? You make the trap all the closer, tighter around you because you have identified yourself as a person who, think, who thinks evil sex thoughts. The evil sex thoughts may have been there. What a waste of time. How foolish did any thoughts like that. When you see these thoughts go through you, uh, I want to ask you a question. What headquarters in you commanded you to think, think those sex thoughts? Where was the headquarters for them? You can't find it, can you? There is no headquarters. See, that's too bad for your ego now. Because you can't say, I am the originator of my evil sex thoughts. You can't do that anymore. You're beginning to fade out just a, just a little bit. 
you, here, this is very important what I just said. You want to attribute all kinds of so-called evil and good to yourself, don't you? You want to attribute them to you because now you've got a point of self-reference, which is a lie. Look, I, t I better tell you something. You don't exist at all like you think you do. You are not you. You can't think yourself into existence. You can't recreate yourself into existence. What you can do is know for sure that you are none of these things, so that you have no ideas about existence, about power, about goals and other stupid things. You have no ideas about yourself at all. You tell me why you should have one single idea about yourself at all in your whole life. You can't tell me. And I can tell you a million reasons why you shouldn't have ideas about who you are. And I can summarize them by saying because they're wrecking your life. They have made you what you are today. And I know you're not satisfied. It's dangerous for you to live the way you are. It's dangerous for you to not be on the hill where the sun is shining. It's dangerous for you to not be there because if you're not on top of the hill, you're down in that dark jungle below and not even knowing that you're in a jungle. How many of you were angry today? Frustrated? Resentful of the world, right? Huh? I wanted to blow it up. When you became angry today, you fought for your own anger. You fought for your own desolation. You fought for your own misery. I'm telling you, there's a new way. There's another way. You ever walked along the beach, the shore, and you see thousands of footprints, people running along the shore, walking along, and they sink down deep, and the sand goes down under their weight, of course, and makes a deep impression. There are thousands of footprints in different directions. It's not smooth, is it? I'm trying to, I'm giving you an illustration, listen to it. And there it is, all marked up, all the shore, 50 yards back from the shoreline to way on back, and all along, as long as you can see. The tide rises, and a wave comes up, and it washes over those footprints. And when it recedes, what do you see? It's not quite so sharply scarred as it was before, is it? And another wave comes up and the tide rises, goes up higher, and then it recedes and the shore is smoother than it was before. Something, something outside of those footprints is beginning to erase them. So the tide continues to rise and to flow onto the shore. And every time it comes back, back and forth, and you can picture it in your mind, can't you, now, that the whole shore is flat and smooth and beautiful. No signs of, no signs of human beings at all, thank heaven. Beautiful, as nature originally made it. Your life is pretty, has pretty much been stepped on, huh? With you, the principal steppy. by your consent. Other people, oh, they did terrible things, didn't they? You didn't know, you didn't know that it was wrong, and so they took you, they hurt you. And we know that, we understand that you didn't know it was wrong. If you knew it was wrong, you wouldn't have permitted them to do that to you, but you didn't, and we understand that, and God understands that. But now you have a chance to see that this, that, this, that, is wrong 
And when you see that, that is the light. Now you let some psycho, some sicky, you, you let them come along and trample your life. You know how to say no, don't you? Now listen. See, you, you, the trouble with you is your mind works in degrees. For, and, and it works wrongly in spiritual degrees because it has a false parallel with physical health. If I was to ask you how you are or your health is, you range all the way from 50, 50 good and bad to maybe 95 uh, good and 5% bad, 99% good in degrees, doesn't it? You've got a little cold or whatever. I order you, I direct you to stop thinking that way spiritually. I order you to not think at all about spiritual health. I order you to invite the light. I order you to to stand aside, sit on a box or something a little higher on the beach there, and, and you watch and see what happens to all the scars inside you. You watch how your physical health, too, how it begins to be smoothed off a little at a time. Pretty soon it's all gone. How many of you were stabbed by pain today? You understand that. Stabbed by pain. You understand that? Now, when you were, I know what happened to you. You're in such a habit of enjoying the habit of having pain. And you're afraid to let it go. And you think that maybe it's a good thing if you hang on to it. And this is your old ego self talking. I order you to rise in spiritual heroism. And you can say exactly what I'm going to say if you want. By the grace and power of God himself, I am not going to permit my spirit to be stabbed again by that thought that I might lose that person or that position. By the power of God himself, I am not. You better get fierce. Going to go along with that thought that said, if only I had bought that house five years ago, look where I would have been. I am telling you that is darkness talking to you. And if you don't come here to ever meeting and listen and work, if you don't, you'll never understand what I'm talking about. You'll hear my words, and you'll be stabbed 50 times a day and night. What's the matter with you that you think that darkness has the power? I told you it has none. That little innocent rabbit on the shore running around the woods way up in back of the ocean. How can it be touched by a shark? You, you little bunnies are venturing too close to that water. Your pain depends upon your psychological position, your spiritual position, location. And you don't have to stay where you now are. I want you to remember that phrase, stab of pain. And I want you to notice it when it happens to you. If you don't notice it when it happens to you, you can't begin to make other connections and you won't be able to sit up on the beach and watch the waves come down and smooth out all the scars in your life. It doesn't, it doesn't make a bit of difference what any one of you in this room have done. If you're guilty of murder, if you broke into someone's store and stole their goods at night and the police didn't catch you. If you hurt that other man or that woman, no matter what you've done, no matter what you've done, if you are willing to have the human interest in studying human nature, the healing can begin and the healing can end. And it will be different than you 
think it will be, and I'll briefly tell you what it will be, and then we'll stop. You will understand that all those terrible things that happened to you and that you thought you committed, they were committed all right. Of course you broke into that drugstore when you were 18 and sold all that stuff and nobody caught you. Of course it happened. You were responsible for it happening because you were a dark human being and assaulting that other person and hurting him. You're responsible because you're responsible because you are a sleeping human being, but it is your duty in life to wake up and see that you're asleep, to see that you did it in darkness. And when you do that, you understand that you are demon-possessed. You're all demon-possessed, every one of you. I know you are. When I see your gloomy faces, I know what's got you. I know, that you, I know who you're living with inside when I see your faces. You're demon-possessed, and you understand that. And you understand all that we've talked about, and you can, be, you can see that you can begin to, to escape the darkness that has you. Or rather, if you're willing to give up, if you're willing to give up everything, I said everything, give up the last single thought of personal identification, of identity, give up the last idea, Give it up so that you're completely gone. You will experience something that millions and billions talk about but never experience. And I'll tell you what it is. It is called being born again. And you'll, you'll know in your heart and in your spirit what that means. And you'll know that millions and millions of so-called Christians and religious people who use that phrase, you'll understand them because you will, you will look at them and you'll say, ah, I know, that used to be me. That man, that used to be me. I know he, he is me years ago. And I know why, I, know why I, I fought this and I know why he'll fight it. Be grateful for the grace of God that can change you even against your, even against your own wishes to change. Take ten minutes. I'll tell you how it goes. You, all of you, you new people, as well as you old people, you still think you can win. All of you in this room, you try to forget what you heard here tonight, even five minutes of it. Try to forget it. You never will. Shall I tell you why? Because you heard the truth. And the reason you fought it inside yourself, of course, is because you knew you were hearing the truth. Your old stupid ego nature, cluttered with the junk of the ages, cluttered with lies and falsehoods. That is what spoke up and didn't like what it heard. I know that. And I know what's going to happen to you. I've told you before. And I don't even have to tell you. I'll tell you how to be your own prophet of what's going to happen to you unless you accept the truth, which is in this room. Not my truth. The truth doesn't belong to me. It belongs to anyone who wants it. You're going to get more sneering. You're going to get more scared. And you're going to get more desperate to, to hang around people who are as big a liar as you are. Because the only comfort you have in your lie is to associate with other liars so you can lie to each other and say, we're telling the truth and those other people are telling a lie. You notice how much energy you spend doing that. Notice how desperate you are to prove yourself. Now let me talk a little bit more about demon possession. It's got you. Even if you sneer at the idea of demon possession, that is demon possession. And you're too stupid to know it. You're so willing to be deceived so that you can be the great scholar 
the great person who knows so much. You're willing to be deceived. You know, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a fact. I wouldn't trade, I wouldn't be in your shoes. Let me rephrase that. I wouldn't be in your shoes for the whole universe and everything in it if I could just own it all and do what I wanted with it. I wouldn't be in your shoes if I could own the whole universe and everything in it. Because I don't want to live in the hell that you're living in. And you don't like to hear that, do you? You know who doesn't like to hear it? The devil's in you, the hell in you. You're not going to forget what you heard tonight. You try it. You'll never succeed. What you can do, what you can do if you have even one ounce of sense is to permit yourself to be defeated, to let your hard egotism start to melt down in the light of truth. Now, the reason you don't do that, you new people listen especially, the reason I see, I know you. I know every one of you in this room. I, I know you in ways you can't begin to understand that I know you. I've never seen you before. I know you. All you people in the back row, I know everything about you. What you can do is begin to die to yourself. And I will promise you from personal experience that if you do die, you will live. If you don't die, you will have eternal death, which is what you have now. Because you will have clung to your time self with all its violence, with all its hatred, with all its sneering. Look, look, you, you will understand this. When you know something in ordinary life, let's say you're your skilled opera singer, okay? You know all about singing opera. And someone comes up and asks you questions about it or challenges you because you know your subject, you don't get excited, you don't get mad, you say, you don't understand what you're saying when you say so-and-so opera was written by, I know the fact. When you're, when you're really spiritually home, you just talk calmly, you don't have to convince yourself of anything. It's when you're a liar that you get agitated, that you have to sneer at what you hear in this room. It's when you're, it's when you're demon possessed and when you are lost. Oh, listen, listen. I, I know how terrified you are, all of you. I understand that. I know why you're terrified. The reason you're terrified is because you're worshiping darkness, and who wouldn't be scared doing that? Mm -hmm. See, the bear in the forest again, the wounded bear in the forest, he's got a sharp cut on him from something other. A, a evil hunter shot him and hurt his leg, and he's severely wounded, it's painful. And the ranger comes along, and the ranger tries to get close to the bear so he can help him, so he can put him in the animal hospital and bind up his leg and set him free, whole, and healed again. The, the bear can't understand. He's going to fight the ranger, isn't it? The bear really believes that ranger is going to hurt him again. The bear really believes that ranger is going to hurt him again, that that other man did. So he's going to, he's going to, he's going to attack the very human being who could save him. Now you, you people in this room, you're doing the same thing, and I'm trying to tell you where well, you're making a mistake. If you don't come back to further classes here, it's because you have believed the lie that the truth is trying to hurt you. But even that is false because you don't know what truth is. You're talking about truth and you have no idea what it is and you never have and you never will unless you come back here. All right, I'll make the, the prophecy. 
on the life of every one of you in this room, every one of you. If you don't come back here and begin to, to become a sensible human being, cut yourself off from all those psychos that you hang around with, you know they're psychos. You know that you are. And that's why you cling to each other. Darkness loves darkness because that's all it knows. If you don't come back to this class and yield yourself to God, not to the word God, which you've done now, but to God himself, by, by giving little by little, it's so long and hard, you, you'll never do it alone. I'm telling you, you've tried to do it alone and you get in with a bunch of sickies like yourself and you all called yourself saints and knowing the answers. Take a look at the faces of the people you hang around with. Look how angry they get. Look how the, the touchy little egos, you, you know you touch them in the wrong place and that great spiritual human being gets mad, doesn't he? All of you here have one chance. I'll make it broader than that. The whole world has one chance. You know what that chance is? For the world to come to this class? The world to come to the teachings of truth. I will prophesy that you're going to slide downhill fast. If you reject what you've heard tonight, there's now, now that having heard it, there's no excuse for you anymore. If you want to continue to be a liar to yourself, and if you want to quickly run around and talk to friends about those terrible people out in Boulder City, you are a devil. And I know you are. And I also know that you, devil shark, can't touch the innocent rabbits on land. No way. Would you like just a brief history? Ever since we started these classes seven, eight years ago, we have been attacked in one way or another by hundreds of sickies. One way or another, letters, phone calls, other things. Well, we're still here talking about the future. And where are the sickies? Well, oh, I better tell you this. Some of them are dead. Right. Some of them died of the curse that they permitted to remain on themselves after coming to some of the lectures. They're dead. I'm gone. They're dead, man. Others are going more insane than they were before because they rejected the truth. And every one of you here listening to me say these strong things, you know that every single word I am saying is true. I know that. I know that you know that I'm telling you the truth. Okay, what's your decision? It's up to you. Do you have an interest in do you have an interest in studying human evil? If you go all the way to the end, you'll you'll see how everything that tried to keep you from going to the end was a lie, including your fear of death. All of you here in this room have a fear of death. Every single one of you in front of me fear death. I know, don't lie to me. Don't waste your time lying. If you don't want this, get out and stay out. But don't come here and lie to me. I can feel it in the atmosphere with some of you. You're afraid of death. You're already dead. You were already dead and don't know it. The truth that we're giving you here will give you life. Eternal life. You're not alive. You don't have to, you don't have to go through your days and torturous nights convincing self, yourself that you're right. In a little book that we're putting out, we have a definition of hell. And it has a very brief definition. There's the word hell. And the definition of, of hell is trying to prove you're right when you're wrong. That hell. Yeah. You want to continue to live in hell? You don't have to. You can wake up. You, you can know. You can know for the first time something you don't know tonight. And you lie about this all the time too. You can know that God actually exists. You don't know that now because you are worshiping yourself as God and not knowing it.
You want people to think well of you. You want people to like you. You want to have friends. You want to have supporters. You want to have companions. You want to have people in your life. Why do you want to have people in your life when people are such crumbs? Just like you. You know better than anyone else. You're a crumb. You know what a crumb is? Someone who has no conscience, no decency. Who doesn't care how many lies he tells in order to keep his stupid ego intact? That's what a bum and a crumb is. That's what you are. Every one of you. Every one of you. You have no decency at all. All you, all you know what to do is to lie. And you've lied so long and so hard you don't even know that you're a liar. Let me tell you what relief is. See, you're, you're not in a state of relief and relaxation and freedom now. Because you fear what will happen to you if you lose the approval of this man, this woman, these people. Even your parents, maybe you're grown up, you're, you're 40 and 50 and you still want the approval of your parents or uh, uncles or, or whatever. I want to tell you, now listen, you, you want relief, you know. Never mind the commercials on TV about relief, we'll give you real relief. <laughs> relief is to be free of the crumbs you now want of the bums that you now think are precious to you, necessary to you. Those crumbs who helped make your life as it is today, your relatives, for example. Don't you know that you despise your relatives? Don't you know that you hate your friends? Don't you know you hate your friends? You have to hate your friends because you're both in the state of the ocean. You're both sharp. I am telling you, you despise your best friends. And you despise yourself. You despise your own cowardice. Now, for the relief. Relief is to walk free in this world. To have relationships with friends here. Talk with the grocery money as you check your groceries out. And you may even live with people. If any of you live with another person, I'll tell you what your aim in life should be, to be psychologically free of that person you're presently living with. And when you're psychologically free, there may be, depends on many circumstances, you may be physically free of him or her too. Because you having made the determination to take the path home and that other person didn't, you're going to quarrel. That home is going to have a lot of misery in it. Now, relief is to never be tied to anyone by wanting something from them. Now, by that definition, how many false friends do you have where you want something? What do you want? Uh, approval? You want to, uh, you're commissioned by selling them something? You men want sex from a woman? You stupid men, selling your soul to that woman for sex. What do you want from the other person? Give up your false life, and that will automatically give that false need up for that other person. Then, if that person is in your life, which may or may not be, there'll never be any quarrel between you and that other person. Because you've made it very, very clear, or rather the reality inside of you has made it very, very clear. No more nonsense. No more lies. Dear lady, if you think you're going to, here's the men talking to the lady now, if you think you're going to con me with your tears or your anger or your fury anymore, goodbye. Goodbye, lady. And you walk out the door. Where do, you, where do you have to say goodbye to another human being, psychologically or physically? Oh, what a relief to be free of your own hatred of the people you love. You know that you hate people you love, don't you? As if you're capable of love. 
scum like you. Well, that's what you are. As if you're capable of loving, you toss the word around as if you have it. Which, which shows what, in, uh, what an incredible psychopath you are. Talking about love when all you have is hatred. Look, I know you. I can sit here very calmly and insult you like this all night long because I know it's the truth and you know it's the truth. There's no quarrel. There's no quarrel. You know that and I know it. There's no quarrel at all. I'm telling you the facts. The facts that can save you. This morning we will see how we can use the opportunity that is before us here in this life to use the opportunity that we have to find a new life. Now, at the start, you don't know anything at all about the new life. It's a word, a pair of words to you. It is something that your ordinary mind can't comprehend. And the reason that is important to emphasize is because we so easily slide into imagination. When I say you have an opportunity for a new life, your desires seize that phrase and get excited. Ah, the advancement I wanted, the career, the freedom from this horrible world where I can just do what I want. A thousand different ideas come into your mind when I say there's an opportunity for a new life. So don't have any opinions at all about its nature. So that's a start. Now listen to this. To take advantage of, to use, to receive the opportunity that you have seated here this morning, to use that opportunity, you must Finally, eventually, all together, once and for all, conclusively, and you'll see why I'm emphasizing that, you must pronounce yourself incapable of self-change. You now think that you can change things for yourself. And even though there's a part of you that that, that says, oh no, I don't believe that at all. I know that there's a large part of you that still thinks that by using its thoughts, by using your intellect, that you can change the kind of a person you are. And those of you who have been here for a long time know that it is impossible for thoughts to change you. Thoughts can only revolve within the squirrel cage, going around and around again. They can't get out of the squirrel cage. So listen to the phrase, you of yourself, no one else, you of yourself must pronounce yourself incapable of being a different kind of a person. Now you push this fact away, this right judgment on yourself, you push it away because it is too fearful to you. Because you say, if I am left alone with the fact that I can't get over my vicious temper, that I can't get over this greed and ambition that I have. If, if I can't get over it, then how can I get over it? See, there's the squirrel cage operating again. So you fear to pronounce the verdict on yourself of the inability to change yourself because you don't know what would come after it. Imagine a criminal. Now this happens every day in ordinary courts of the land. A criminal is brought before the judge, and the first time the judge, he robs homes, let's say, and assaults people, a criminal. And the first time he's brought before the judge, the judge sentences him to a few months. He gets caught again. He keeps up his criminal behavior, and the judge, same judge this time, sentences him to a couple years. The next time he comes up for the judge, third time, the judge says, well, I'll try, I'll try something else with this man. He said, I'll, I'll try uh, turning him over to um, the parole officer who will give him constant supervision, see that he has employment. 
as a home, so he won't have any incentive to rob anymore. So that's what he does. He turns over to a parole officer. And the criminal continues to be a criminal in spite of that. The next time the judge says, well, maybe religion will work. So he turns them over to a religious group, some kind of a home or retreat they have where he gets religious teachings. And for a while, they, this will sound familiar to you, I'm sure, for a while the criminal goes to every religious service they have at this social house. And he gets active in religious activities and he passes out Bibles at the meetings and things like that. And he gets, comes up before the judge again because he, after passing out the Bibles, he snuck out and robbed a store. And the judge says, well, something's got to work with this man. And so he says, oh, okay, we'll give him a different environment. And he knows of another rehabilitation center way out in the Missouri Ozarks. So he sends him there. You know, he was a big city criminal. Send him out to the beautiful countryside. You're following me, aren't you? I know you are. So he sends him to the Missouri Ozarks farm for incorrigibles. And he escapes the farm after three months and commits crime in the small town near the farm. Well, finally the judge, after about the 20th time, does something. He says, Sir, you are an unchangeable criminal, a chronic criminal, irreversible. Your nature is irreversible. We tried everything. 20 different solutions for you. Let's face the fact once and for all that you cannot change yourself. So we'll just have to put you away permanently in jail. And that's where he goes. You have not pronounced that verdict on yourself in spite of the fact that you have given yourself 20 different opportunities. What was it? The marriage? The marriage would make you happy and cease your criminal-like insecure behavior and you're just as insecure after getting married. The divorce would do it. You still continued with your criminal nature. By criminal nature meaning the dark part of you, the unhappy part. Don't you know it's criminal to be unhappy? If you don't know that, I'm telling you that. If you're unhappy, you're a psychological criminal. You're apart from reality, and therefore you are indeed a criminal, and you, you prey on other people by the way you talk, by your very existence. Psychological crime is a state, not only an act. The act comes out of the state, right? You are a certain way, you think a certain way inwardly, and where opportunity comes up, you commit the crime of taking someone, of hurting them in some way. A realization has to come to you. The realization that you, you can indeed change yourself. There's, there's nothing you can do. This is a fact. This is an absolute fact. And I'll, I'll put emphasis on the word you. There's nothing you can do to take advantage of the opportunity that you have for inner transformation, for a new life. Having faced that, having having given yourself a leniency for 20 times and see, it doesn't work. Nothing works. All you do is commit an offense and feel guilty about it and apologize and then commit the same offense again. Feel guilty, apologize for it. Right around, around, right? We're describing ourselves, aren't we? The offense, the guilt, the apology, the offense, the guilt, the apology. On and on and on. Do you dare, do you have the courage to pronounce the final verdict on yourself? No more chances, no more. That criminal had 20, you've given yourself 5,000 ways, ways in which you're finally going to be happy, finally no longer going to be a hostile person. Nothing has worked. Do you dare to pronounce the final verdict? I tell you, I, I direct you to do so right now. 
that would be close to being the same thing as giving up consciously. That would be close to being the same thing as seeing the impossibility of thoughts about yourself changing your nature. See, all, how all these things we've talked about all come together, they're all connected in one way. Finally, ah, finally, when you, after, after, you as the judge pronouncing final sentence on the criminal, see, you're both the judge and the criminal. When the judge in you pronounces final sentence on the criminal, a great, marvelous realization will, will come to you. I te I'm telling you, it will come to you. And here's what it is. You will realize that only something outside of life can change you. Oh, now let's see. Now let me repeat that. You understand, not dimly at first, but it's, it's clear, as dim as it is, man, you'll never lose it. It's impossible to lose it. Once you buy a, buy a lamp through sacrificing something else, you can never lose the lamp. You, you come to see that the criminal is a criminal, period. He is never going to change. No reformation, all that is outward. Remember the criminal in jail passed around the Bibles and sang the hymns, and he conned the parole board into thinking that he was now religious? They all do that. All criminals do that, by the way. I've changed. You know. Then they write books, you know, from con to Christ. <laughs> the realization comes after you have given up that something outside of life alone can change you, but you don't know what that is. Oh, you're in for a long period of agony. You think you were miserable before, you just wait till you come to this. Drifting all alone out on that sea, having no hope of rescue out on that raft, and it's hot and the waves are high and you know you're going to die. The rescue will come. It has to come. There's a certain procession of right logic in spiritual elevation. One, two, three, four, five. Certain absolutely solid states which follow one right after another. But you have to go to one before you can get to two. You have to go to two before you can get to three, four before you get to five. Having pronounced the verdict of guilty and of being a chronic criminal who can do nothing but be a criminal, that realization will be the next step. Dimly at first, as I said, but you begin to understand real spiritual progress must consist of. If you want to put it simply, it consists of your willingness to give up all your present ideas about being rescued. See, the criminal can never reform himself, but you still want to be the criminal, and yet you say, I want to no longer be a criminal. That is called self-splitting. That's called paranoia. That's called the criminal singing hymns in the prison chapel one day, and when he's released, he goes out and robs a store. He doesn't see the contradiction in himself. Now, the next step in this, remember all I've said up till now, and we would now develop it a little more. All you have now, presently, besides criminal behavior, criminal nature. Don't you, you understand when you hate someone, isn't that criminal? What do you think psychological criminality is? It's something that's alien to your real nature, something that's wrong. Huddle up inside yourself. 
You don't. You people don't know what you're missing by not determining to break through. You don't know what you're missing. You're taking your hell as heaven. So all you have, really, listen to this phrase, please. You might want to write it down. All you have is a cover story. You know what a cover story is? And you hit you didn't it. You already your minds went to what a cover story is. Cover story to bring it into a illustration is the Brit the British spy is going to land by parachute in Germany during the war. And the spy is given a cover story. You you've seen the movies. They get him aside in the British intelligence headquarters and they give him a another name. They give him another character, background, where he was born. And then they all shout at him. You've seen it. It's, it's traditional in a spy movie. Okay, what's your name? And he gets his cover story pretty well down. Huh? No problem yet. He's among friends. When he parachutes into Germany and starts going about gathering secret information about the enemy and sabotaging trains, when he starts doing that, he gets awful nervous, doesn't he? Of course he does. Because he's going around, and all he has is a cover story, is a cover up about who he really is. Now, does that explain, doesn't that explain your nervousness in this world? You are in enemy territory. But you see, you are part of it too. Because you're one of the enemies. But we use a story to put things into opposites to make it clear. So all the time this spy with a cover story goes around Berlin. He's looking over his shoulder. He's wondering. Some, someone just looks at him casually and he feels nervous, right? Have you ever done anything bad? How many have ever done anything bad? <laughs> I see two hands out. <laughs> Weren't you nervous about getting caught about him? Over it? So he wanders around nervously, apprehensive, and he gets caught. You know how he gets caught? He forgets his cover. He, he, you look, you can't remember your false roles that good. Nobody can. You're always breaking down, aren't you? You're always saying the wrong thing, thinking the wrong thing, acting the wrong thing, aren't you? So the British spy was sitting at a cafe one afternoon and one of the German secret agents comes up in back of him and says to him in English, good afternoon. And he turns around and says, yes, good afternoon, in English. Your real nature always shows through, doesn't it? All say yes. Why not get rid of the, the cover story and everything involved in it? How would you like to have a new profession, a, a spiritual profession, called being a, a spy catcher? You're the spy catcher, you're the spy. Isn't that what we've been doing all these years? Walking down the street and seeing that item in the store window and seeing the the usual impulse to say, I want that. Then seeing the price, and the price is just about, just about right to keep you in 50-50 conflict. <laughs> it's pretty expensive, and yet I want, isn't that a terrible state to be in? I want it, but my wallet doesn't want it. So you, you, make, the, you make the decision one way or another, but whatever way you make a decision, you're miserable. You pay the $20 you really didn't want to pay. You look at it and you almost hate it for capturing you, right? I'll get, tell you what to do. If in doubt, get out. Walk by. Don't buy it. And watch, watch your mind what happens after that when you're in this 50-50 deal. Just watch and watch how it fades out. And, and you'll finally come to see how foolish you are, not regarding the object but permitting your mind to be in that kind of a situation. Permitting, permitting yourself to be so infantile in your thinking, which you've been all your life, 
is to want and yet not want. Yes or no. And only intelligence can say yes or no. How many of you have intelligence? No hands. Now I have some marvelous news for you. You watch how, how you rejoice inwardly when I give it to you. Are you ready for some good news? Yes. Now you better say yes. <laughs> Ignorance is not fatal. <laughs> Aren't you delighted? Nancy is. Ignorance is not fatal. Weakness. It is not necessary to continue to be weak, to falter, to be doubtful to be torn between yes and no over this or that. Ignorance can, in a very special way, turn to intelligence. Let me tell you a, a special feature about weakness, ignorance. Now, I'll illustrate it for you. Weakness can still recognize wrongness. You better write that one down. Weakness can still recognize wrongness. It may not be able to act, but there's the dim, covered up realization that wrong is wrong. Now you'll see what I mean. Weakness can still recognize wrongness. In fact, I'll give you two parallels to that. One of the ladies in this class once told me an in interesting story, and you'll see how it connects. This lady who's in this class went to a meeting with a girlfriend of hers. And I went to a meeting in which the speaker told everyone in the audience certain types of actions they could take to make money, to be popular, things like that. And one of the things the speaker gave them was certain types of deception, which you practice on people in order to deceive them, get their money or whatever. And that was part of the talk of how to be successful is how to deceive people. Then when this lady in class went home with her girlfriend, <coughs> the girlfriend thought it was great. What a great talk, what a nice way to get ahead in life. Now, the class lady was weak, but she understood the wrongness of it. She could, you know, haven't you been in a position like that? You know, you, you could sense, you know, that's not right. Is it right to steal money from people under pretense? Is it right to hurt another person in any way? Now see, weakness can still recognize wrongness. You may not be able to do anything about it. You find your own examples for this. You may not be able to say no yet to the temptation because you're simply not strong enough. But I'll tell you, that recognition is a sign that there is still hope for you, that you can still change yourself. As long as that is there, you still have conscience. Whoa, whoa unto the individual who fails to heed that conscience over a period of years, ignores it to the point where he can hear it no more. All they have is a quick intellectual attack. They've said no so long to the light that they can no longer see it. And they, they are the, the chronic criminals. They're, they're the criminals inwardly as that man, man who stood before the judge all the time. Haven't you ever, how many of you were teenagers at one time? Okay. Now when you were a teenager, I'm going to tell you what happened to you. And you can parallel it to your own experience, but you'll recognize what I'm talking about. Remember that time when you were a teenager and you were out with a gang, you were wandering down the street and having nothing real to do and all you're doing blabbing about yourself and the latest movies and all that. 
and someone said to you, someone said to the group, you know, eight or ten of you, one of them said, hey, let's go spray paint on old Mr. Jones' hardware store. Spray paint on the window. You know what he did to us the other day? No, yeah, yeah, yeah. We know what he did to us. They all agreed, yes, they go down and they're going to spray paint on the window of old Mr. Jones' hardware store. And he was only 40 at that. He went. <laughs> Anyone older than he was old, right? right. So you, one, of the, one of the kids got a can of paint, and you all went down there, and you giggled and laughed and jumped out of the car and sprayed paint all over the window and put a word on there, some obscene word probably. And you got in the car and raced away real fast, laughing. And in your imagination, you could hardly wait till other people and old Mr. Jones himself saw it. No one saw you doing it, so you felt safe. Now look, you, you knew it was wrong, didn't you? You know that you knew it was wrong, and a part of you was hoping that someone would have the strength to say no. Why didn't you say no? You wanted to please your boyfriend, your girlfriend. If you'd said no, we better not do it. You feared the other eight people looking at you and saying, "Why? Why you say no? See, you're not nice. You're not one of the gang." Look, it happened 50 times to you when you were young, didn't it? In your own way. You know that. All right. I have just proved, and you've proved to yourself, that weakness can still recognize wrongness. You can still simply see within yourself that wrong is wrong. Pronouncing yourself guilty and going through all these other things we've talked about is the only thing that will enable you to say, not to eight people, not to 8,000 people, not to 80,000, not to 8 million, that you say to the entire world, no, I know it's wrong. I know it's wrong for me, it's wrong for you, it's wrong against Mr. Jones, it's wrong against society, it's wrong spiritually, because anything that hurts another person is a violation of spiritual law. You, you know that's wrong. And can you see, can you see, when you arrive at this state where you're going to say no to the temptations of this wicked, wicked world, can you see how it itself dissolves the need for a cover story? And can you see how it dissolves the need for nervousness? Now here's one difficulty in connection with that. There's a, a certain part of all of us that sees an opportunity of some kind, a criminal opportunity, let's say, to spray paint. And there's a part of us that thrills. There's a part of us that simply thrills. And even you, when that other kid mentioned, let's spray the paint on the hardware store, there's a part of you that thrills at the idea. Because you are going to be someone different. Everyone, you, you're, you're going to have power over the whole town and nobody knows about it. You're safe and you're sitting here, I'm the one who did that. I was part of the gang that did that. It gives you a thrill to get away with something, to have secret power. Do you see the lust we have for power? The power, look, look at this, are we mad or not? The power, we have the power to injure other people and we take great pride in that. Now I want, I want you to be the spy catcher who among other dangerous cover-up spies recognizes and catches the part of you that simply vibrates with false pleasure over the very idea of doing something wrong. Because if you can, that spy catcher can catch the idea in the idea stage, just to know rightness is saying no. Just to, just to understand that it's wrong to do that, that is strength. But 
you're with the gang. That's already wrong. You're associating with yourself. You're associating with your own wrong nature to be with them, which is why you like to be with them. You're being with yourself when you're being with them. You're evil, they're evil, and this evil loves each other. By understanding, you won't go out at night and join the gang at all. They'll give you phone calls and ask you what you want. The boys will still come around, or the boys, or the girls will come around. Remember I told you last night that the, the beauty of rightness is that it has no involvement with wrongness, no kind of a psychological involvement at all. This is what is called real happiness. To know indeed that you have nothing in common with that, that temptation to do something wrong, to hurt another person. You ever, you ever think about what real pleasure is, real contentment is? To put it to briefly, real contentment is for you and you and you to not be you and you and you. You are not content. You are not satisfied. 